Well, I'm sure some folks are still joining, but good evening and thank you all for being here. My name is Colleen Smith and I am part of the communications team here at Tree Weight Loss and we are so glad to see such a great crowd tonight and glad you're willing to spend the evening with us. Um, this is a Tree Weight Loss webinar focused on a bariatric revisional procedure known as the endoscopic revision of the vertical sleeve gastrectomy, otherwise known as VSG. So Dr. McGowan's gonna kick us off in just a few minutes, but wanted to start with a few housekeeping items. Um, this session is gonna include a brief presentation. I think we're gonna try and keep it to 15, 20 minutes at the most. Um, high level overview of the procedure, how it works, who's a candidate and what to expect kind of before, during and after the procedure. Um, anytime throughout the presentation, you're welcome to use the question and answer function to submit your question, but we'll wait and answer all the questions at the end so we can get through the presentation. If you need to leave any time during the webinar, that's perfectly fine. We'll have a recording of the full session to share after this session. So that is it for now. Without further ado, I'm going to pass it over to Dr. McGowan to kick us off. All right, thank you, Colleen, and welcome everybody. Thanks for joining us tonight. Thanks for taking time out of your evenings to uh, join us to learn about the uh, VSGR, as we abbreviate it, but that is the endoscopic revision of a surgical sleeve. So we're gonna talk about that, uh, maybe who's a good candidate, how the procedure works, how the process works within our program. But most importantly, we do want to answer any questions that you have. So you can start right now, punching those questions into the Q&A uh, portion of Zoom, and we will get to those. Uh, so let's begin. Uh, so to start, uh, let's talk about weight recurrence, weight regain. This is common. Uh, we know that the surgical sleeve, which is the most uh, common uh, bariatric surgery performed worldwide uh, is highly effective. Uh, it's a very effective procedure, but no treatment is truly permanent. Uh, it's a really important point that we stress with all of our patients. We know that obesity is a chronic, progressive, and relapsing condition. And as such, we know that the average patient will regain about 30% of the weight that they've lost over time, and about one in five or 20% of patients uh, may regain all of the weight that they've lost. Importantly, there is no shame in regaining weight. Our bodies are actually designed to promote weight regain. And that's just what, what can happen over time. But what we need is safe, effective, and available treatments to help patients when that does happen. And um, we know that there are many things that can contribute to weight regain. So life events, of course, uh, medications, maybe you were started on a medication for a health condition and gained some weight. Uh, definitely you can get somewhat off track with nutrition. Uh, or, or the lifestyle components, but there's also the actual physical components, the anatomic factors, which could be described as loss of restriction. So over time, we know that a sleeve can dilate or stretch, and sometimes the sleeve just wasn't made that tight to begin with by the surgeon who performed it. So these are some of the factors that can lead to weight regain or weight recurrence over time. Now, what can we do in that scenario? How can we help you get back on track? So there are Several options. One could be an anti-obesity medication like Wegovy. Um, there are surgical options. Uh, occasionally, it's a surgeon may be able to actually revise the sleeve itself. That's often um, not a possibility and, and somewhat challenging. More likely, a surgeon would recommend conversion to a gastric bypass or to a duodenal switch, so to a different surgery. Uh, the problem is that these conversions to other surgeries are hampered by a, a very high complication rate of about 20%. So they're not generally considered the optimal treatments. We offer a different option, which is the endoscopic revision of the gastric sleeve. And so this is a non-surgical tightening uh, in a sense of the sleeve from within. And the big difference here is we're not cutting through the abdominal wall. We're working from the mouth uh, downward with an endoscope. And that means the risk is much, much lower. So instead of that 20% or more, it's less, well less than 1%. Um, but we're taking that gastric sleeve, which has stretched over the years, perhaps, uh, and uh, returning it to its original state endoscopically. And I'll walk through how we do that. So here's an animation uh, of the procedure. So if we're zooming in on the stomach uh, from the outside, this is a normal stomach pre-surgery. Uh, when the surgical sleeve is performed, the surgeon staples and cuts away about 80% of the stomach, leaving that tube-like uh, banana-shaped sleeve. However, over time that can dilate and stretch and then the stomach can accommodate more food, which makes you feel like you've lost that sense of restriction or fullness. What we're able to do is go down into the stomach with an endoscope and this little suturing device and place stitches to tighten it again. 
So this restores it to its original shape, if not smaller. And the device that we use attached to the end of the endoscope is, is over here. It's, it's a small needle, uh, needle and thread basically that we control uh, completely endoscopically. So now I wanna show some actual videos uh, of what this looks like before and after. I think this is pretty interesting to see. Uh, so this is uh, a patient um, who presented to us uh, looking for a revision. And so I'm going down into the stomach with the endoscope. On the end is our suturing device. And what I can tell you is that this is a dilated sleeve. So um, it's fairly spacious, especially down here at the bottom. And this is why a patient might describe uh, increased capacity, able to eat larger portions. So this is the before. If you get nothing else out of this, this is the before. Uh, and then about 30 to 45 minutes later, at the conclusion of the procedure, it will look like this. And so it's starting at the bottom and now coming upward. You'll see that the sleeve is narrowed quite significantly, kind of tight against the scope and really restored to a very tight, narrow sleeve. So this is going to um, allow that patient to feel that sense of fullness which, with much smaller portions once again. Okay, uh, just as a reminder to those who are joining or just joined, definitely put your questions in the q and I'm sure I see a bunch that have already been uh, entered there. So we will get to those. All right, uh, moving along, how much weight can you lose with this procedure? So uh, the largest study ever published of the endoscopic revision of a surgical sleeve was actually authored by Dr. Daniel Maselli, our physician uh, from our Atlanta practice. Um, and what, what he showed is the average weight loss at 12 months was around 16% of body weight. Now, what does that mean? Well, if you start at 200 pounds, you would expect to lose around 30 up to 40 pounds. That's average. Um, importantly, the weight loss is less than with the original surgery. Uh, as you might imagine, we're taking an already slightly smaller sleeve and making it smaller. Uh, so the impact is a little less overall, but this is still very significant. Um, more importantly, it's not just about the weight. So we always talk about these non-scale victories, and this is really what it's about. So that 15, 16% or more uh, will lead to, lead to significant improvements in various conditions, high cholesterol, diabetes, fatty liver. I don't need to read through all of these, but major impacts on health. And then there's the non-health things, just feeling better, feeling confident, improving your self-esteem. So these are all the things that we see. Many of the things that are impacted when someone does experience weight recurrence and it can have such an impact on just overall quality of life. So we like to really address all of these. In terms of safety, I touched on this earlier, but just to talk about, you did see a little bit of blood during that uh, video there. Very, very minor, actual bleeding, uh, like uh, an actual complication would be exceedingly rare. So that is less than 1% infection, dehydration. These are the rare things that we see. So what's the process look like? So this is our Atlanta facility. So if you were uh, signed up and scheduled to have a procedure with us, you would arrive about an hour beforehand. We place an IV. We start some IV fluids and give you a dose of an antibiotic. We review your health history and then you'll meet your physician um, and then your anesthesia team and then we'll get started. And so the procedure itself, I mentioned, takes about 30 to 40 minutes, uh, somewhere in that range. This is one of our procedure rooms. You are under general anesthesia. So you're sleeping through it uh, and, and our team will take uh, care of you and monitor you throughout the process. Once you wake up after the procedure, you'll be in a recovery bay for about 45 minutes to an hour. Uh, and at that point, we will send you home. Uh, or uh, if you're traveling in to see us, we'll have you return to a hotel for the night. Then we see you the next morning, and this is a really important visit. This is what we call our hydration visit. It's really just your most important follow-up visit. We'll see you, make sure you're recovering well. We will give you extra IV fluids so that you uh, don't feel like you're having to force liquid down because it can be a little bit difficult those first couple of days. So we're gonna make sure you're hydrated and feeling good. Um, and then you can um, head back, uh, head back home and return to work within a few days. Your team, when you're coming in for the procedure, these are the people you, you might see in the procedure room, your physician, that's Dr. Maselli, your anesthesia provider, endoscopy tech and nurse. Those are uh, the team in the room. So right after the procedure, you're going to experience some symptoms. They're generally really mild. The main thing I, I typically speak to is cramping. We're, we're suturing the stomach. We're making it really snug. You're going to have some cramping for a day or two. Bloating and gas are common, sometimes nausea. Uh, and fatigue because you will be on a liquid diet for uh, a, a period of time, which Victoria will talk about. 
we do recommend three to four days off from work. So it's a big difference from the original surgery that you might've had, which might've been one to two weeks or more. So this is a little bit less, but we do want you to focus on your recovery, focus on your hydration. There are no specific restrictions in terms of lifting. Another key distinction from surgery because there aren't incisions through the abdominal wall, you can do what you feel comfortable doing. And in fact, we want you walking right away that same day, right after the procedure, and then you can increase your activity from there. And you'll always have direct contact with our team 24 seven, that's very important. Okay, so I'm gonna hand things over to Victoria who will speak about, uh, well, I guess I'll mention briefly medical visits. We will see you um, that next day after the procedure uh, within a week and then at three months and then uh, as needed thereafter. But the bulk of your care, aftercare and follow-up will be with our nutrition and health coaching team. So I'll hand off to Victoria. Thanks, Dr. McGowan. Um, so my name is Victoria. I'm one of our dietitians here. And as Dr. McGowan mentioned, following your procedure, we're going to be continuing your care virtually. This will include all of your appointments with your dietitian, including your pre-op and any follow-ups we may have. Um, we'll typically meet you at your pre-op before moving to soft foods and then before moving to regular diet. And then we'll meet monthly for the first six months. After that first six months, we'll meet you on a quarterly basis. Um, but your dietitian can be contacted between appointments for any questions or concerns you're having. This way you feel supported and you know you have support from everyone on your care team throughout the entire process. When you meet with your dietitian at your pre-op, we'll discuss how to eat before your sleeve revision and after. It might be a little bit different than any eating patterns you may have had to follow before your initial bariatric surgery. Um, in some cases, patients are asked to follow a liver reduction diet liver reduction diet. Um, the liver reduction diet is generally two weeks long and incorporates specific protein shakes, small meals. The point of this is to reduce the size of the liver so surgeons can get around and manipulate and operate on organs. But because we're doing this entirely endoscopically, you will not need to follow a liver reduction diet. The only thing that we ask that you do is to follow a full liquid diet the day before your procedure. Um, I have some information here about health coaching, and I'm going to touch a little bit more on that in a minute. In, in regard to nutrition guidelines, so after your procedure, you'll awake from anesthesia and you can be dr begin drinking clear liquids as soon as you're feeling comfortable to do so. There's no need to wait. Um, you will remain on that clear liquid diet for that day and the following day. Clear liquids means things that are not milky in consistency. You want to think things like bone broth, vegetable broth, sugar-free jello or sugar-free popsicles, water, those kind of things. Um, you'll have spe specific protein and fluid goals that you'll need to meet daily. And then on the third day after your revision, you can transition back to that full liquid diet. So that pretty much means liquids that are not clear. Um, so things that do have a milkier consistency, like regular protein shakes, then strained cream soups, um, you can continue or you will continue that liquid diet only for the remainder of the first two weeks following your procedure. After the first two weeks, as long as you're tolerating those liquids well, you'll start having a pureed diet. Um, pureed foods, that's going to be things like applesauce, yogurt, sugar-free pudding, pureed vegetables like fat-free refried beans, mashed potatoes, um, or even pureed squash. You'll only need to eat pureed foods for one week, and then you can always continue having liquids still in that time period as well. Um, at the beginning of week four, you will most likely be ready to start eating soft foods. Um, and at this time, that's when you're going to meet with your dietitian again to discuss that soft foods diet. So when we think of soft foods, we're thinking of things that are fork tender or mashable with the fork. So some really good examples of that, that's going to be things like scrambled or hard boiled eggs, baked fish, canned or moist chicken, um, finely ground poultry and meats, beans, potatoes without skin, overcooked vegetables, some soft fruits like melon and bananas. Um, it's really important to remember that at this point in time, crunchy foods like raw vegetables are still not allowed. Um, and you're going to want to really concentrate on chewing well throughout this phase and going forward. And then finally, at the beginning of week eight, most patients are able to return to a regular texture diet. And at that time, again, you'll have the full support of your entire care team, along with a personalized plan from your dietitian to follow. Um, 
So I do want to go back to what a health coach is for a second. So as a patient having a revision through True You, we have a unique program that allows you to have the opportunity to work with a health coach alongside your other care providers. You'll meet with that health coach at five weeks post procedure, um, and then every three to four weeks for the first year, and then on a monthly basis. So you might be wondering what's the difference between a health coach or a nurse practitioner and dietitians. Well, um, nurse practitioners, dietitians, they focus on listening to your background, your strengths and challenges, and their authorities in their respective fields and are able to give prescriptive advice. On the other hand, your health coach is a partner that affirms what you're doing well and helps you to troubleshoot the areas that you might have historically had trouble changing. So the health coach's specialty is bridging the gap between your doctor, your nurse practitioner, your dietitian's recommendations, and making changes in your daily life. So while your, your nurse practitioner and your dietitian will provide the what to do, your health coaches are going to help you with the how to implement those suggestions. Um, so I want to go over a couple of frequently asked questions in regard to nutrition following having a sleeve revision. Um, so one of the most common ones we get is what's the difference between a clear and a full liquid? So clear liquids are going to be things that are not necessarily crystal clear, um, but they're not a milky consistency. They're not opaque. So clears are going to be things like broth, clear protein supplements, um, electrolyte drinks like Gatorade, Powerade, sugar-free Jello, or popsicles. Um, those are generally tolerated best in the first couple of days following your procedure. Um, then full liquids would be in the beginning. Full liquids are going to be considered cloudy and opaque. You cannot see through them. That's going to be things like milk, protein shakes, regular protein shakes, um, thin strained cream soups, those kind of things. Another thing we often get asked is why do you need to avoid caffeine? So caffeine is a gastric irritant, and that means it can make your already inflamed stomach even more inflamed following your procedure. It can be painful and at the very least uncomfortable, but don't worry, once you've healed, um, you can go back to having caffeinated beverages if you'd like to. Some patients do find that they sleep better or have more energy after laying off the caffeine for a while. Um, and some people even ask about caffeine withdrawal headaches. So I highly recommend that you start weaning from caffeine as soon as you decide that you're wanting to pursue a sleeve revision. You can accomplish this through subbing out regular caffeinated beverages with decaf. Um, if you're somebody who drinks a lot of caffeine each day, you might want to start out by drinking one caffeinated drink and alternating with a non-caffeinated drink. Um, this tends to work well for most people. Um, you want to consider how many excess calories are coming from coffees or caffeinated beverages that aren't, you know, plain coffee or something like that. So if you were to get a caffeine withdrawal headache, I would recommend taking acetaminophen or Tylenol. You can also do a warm, wet washcloth on your forehead, and that should help. And then another, another question we get asked a lot is why can't I drink alcohol? So first and foremost, remember why you're having a sleeve revision performed. You want to lose weight. So alcohol contributes many excess and empty calories into your diet. It also lowers your inhibition and leads to increased mindless eating. Um, it also impacts hydration status. So after any bariatric procedure, dehydration is a real thing. Alcohol exacerbates that dehydration. It's also considered to be a gastric irritant causing inflammation, especially in those beginning phases. Um, alcohol affects your sleep. It's one of the least recognized factors of successful weight loss. After, after having a bariatric procedure, alcohol is going to affect you differently. You may have experienced this with your original surgery. It might hit you harder. You may feel more intensely intoxicated, and it might happen faster. You will also feel more sober quickly, um, but your blood alcohol will remain the same, which leaves you at risk for a DUI. So if and when you decide to consume alcohol, I would highly recommend that you eat and drink at the same time in order to make sure you have something in your stomach. Um, and finally, the jury is out still about whether there's a risk for transfer of addictive behavior from food to alcohol after any bariatric procedure, but most of our research is pointing to this being a reality. So all this to say, be careful and consider the risks to decide if it's truly worth it to you. Um, 
Another pretty common question is how much you'll be able to consume. So your capacity is going to differ from person to person and, and their revision. So it's important not to compare yourself to other patients that you might see online or through social media. Um, we provide you with nutrition guidelines that are going to help you figure out where to begin and will increase your intake over time. Don't expect to eat very small amounts like a bird for the rest of your life. Your dietitian also anticipates your needs to change as we go. Um, just because that need for, for more might increase um, doesn't mean you're doing something wrong. You're going to be eating enough of amount of food that will sustain your health. Um, and by the time you do reach regular diet, a small plate of food, generally around three ounces of some type of animal protein, whether that's like meat, poultry, um, fish, and one cup of vegetables is well tolerated. Um, you could also consider doing a half of a cup of vegetables and a third of a cup of starch if you'd like, like rice, potatoes, or even pasta. Um, and then another question is, what does, what does fullness feel like? So fullness after a sleeve revision is going to be different than it is with a typical stomach and maybe similar to what you experienced with your original surgery, or it could feel completely different. Um, it could feel like a pressure behind the breastbone cramp um, below the rib cage. It might be as simple as a, a belch or a hiccup, sometimes even a runny nose. Those are all your indicators to stop eating or drinking. Um, you you don't want to practice eating to fullness though. Yes, you want to pay attention to those indicators. They're important, but we want to encourage eating to satisfaction. So satisfaction is going to be the absence of hunger or fullness. And so you want to make sure that you're eating enough, but not to your full capacity. Um, so those are a couple of the questions that we get asked the most frequently that I wanted to go over with you. Excellent. Thank you, Victoria. Uh, so just to wrap up uh, this portion, uh, who is a good candidate for this procedure? Uh, well, we generally say it's ideal for someone who had initial success with their surgery, but has experienced weight recurrence and that loss of restriction, that is a key component. Uh, and it's definitely a great solution for someone who does not want to undergo major gastric surgery and those related risks. The most important factor though, is just to be motivated and committed to follow our program which does include all of this lifestyle and behavioral support and change. And of course, remember to stay positive and know that we're here to support you on that journey. Um, so with that, I think we'll jump to some questions. I, I see a bunch of questions there and I will, um, I think I'll stop sharing Colleen and we can, we can tackle some of these. This should be fun. Yeah, sounds good. We have gotten so many great questions. So I'm gonna do my best to, keep up with all of them and get them all answered. And um, it looks like we've got about 35 minutes. So we'll do our best to get to all of them. The first question I've got here is how quickly do most patients lose weight? And that one, I will punt to you, Dr. McGowan. Yeah, but, um, it's, it's an important question. Uh, and everyone's different, first of all. So um, there's no exact rate. Uh, we know that end result are averages being, let's say 15 to 20% of weight. Usually this will take uh, six to 12 months. It does depend on how much you end up losing. It's a little different than medications, which we talked about as an option for someone with weight recurrence, which would be a little bit slower, it might take a year or more to get to that same level. Um, but generally we're gonna support you and just uh, allow your body to lose weight at the rate that it wants to lose. This is definitely uh, not a race. We always say that it's more of a marathon. And especially when we're talking about a revision and the second go around, our goal isn't, necessarily losing the most weight. It's more about achieving a healthy weight and then maintaining it. We really want to focus on that maintenance at this point. Great. Next question is how old do you need to be to get, get to get a gastric sleeve surgery? Um, so I'm assuming that they're talking about um, the VSGR, which is not maybe not technically surgery, but again, I'll let Dr. McGowan address that question about age. Yeah, so in our program, we um, consider patients eligible uh, if they're 21 and older. That is uh, you know, our practice um, uh, preference. Uh, there's no uh, upper age limit per se. It's really about whether this is the right fit for you at whatever stage you are in your life. So uh, what we generally will do is remove, uh, review your health history at a consultation, and then we can decide you know, what the, if it's the best fit for you. Uh, we've treated patients anywhere from 20s to 70s. Um, and, uh, and so it's it really, again, about if it's the right fit for you. Perfect. Next question is, is this procedure covered by insurance? 
sorry, it's a three part question. If you don't have insurance, what is the cost? And um, from Sandy, if it's medically necessary, does that make a difference? Yeah, uh, it's an important question. So currently this procedure is not covered by insurance. Um, Revisions in general are, are typically not covered by insurance. If you look at surgical revisions, they're, they're generally not covered um, for a variety of reasons, one of them being the risk of the surgical revisions. So they're often not covered by insurance. This one in particular, because this is a somewhat newer technology, um, it is, does not have a specific code assigned to it, which is how we kind of work with insurance companies. So it's not covered at this time. So nationally, the cost of uh, sleeve revision using this approach might be somewhere between ten and fifteen thousand dollars nationally. That we recognize that that is a big number. Our goal here is to basically uh, provide as much as we possibly can within that um, within that platform. So that's why we really support you with numerous follow up visits with your uh, registered dietitian and your health coach and your medical team. We really want to make sure you get the most out of that. Understanding that that is a very big investment. Uh, in our program, we do uh, offer financing options, and our team would, would definitely talk to you about those just to, to help you with that. Great. Next question is, how does it work if I'm coming in from out of state, and how many nights uh, would I need to stay in North Carolina? Yeah, so many of our patients do travel to see us either in our North Carolina or Georgia facilities. It's something that we're comfortable with. Uh, you as the patient need to be comfortable with traveling in to have a procedure. But the way that we recommend approaching this uh, is coming in the day before, uh, staying overnight in a hotel. You have the procedure the following day, stay overnight again. We see you the next day. And it's generally best to stay one more night just to make sure you're really feeling your best before you return home. Of course, that depends on how far you're traveling, if you're driving or flying. So in general, plan on being in town three to four days. Uh, so something like that would be safest. That way we make sure that you're safe to return home, that you're feeling your best. And frankly, it's just exhausting to travel, as you know. So imagine adding a procedure on top of that and no food. So, you know, give yourself some time. Yeah. Okay. So uh, I'm going to try and um, get this question out. Uh, if I, if I, uh, it says if I would be a weight loss surgery and it's very expensive, could I be offered medication to help with weight loss? So I think perhaps we're trying to understand if, if perhaps they are not ready to have the procedure, could they work with us to get medication? Yeah, definitely. And that really speaks to finding the, the best option for you as an individual. So it, um, it may not be a revision, you know, it may not, that may not be what's right for you at this time. Uh, we do offer in our program, uh, medical therapy using the newer weight loss medications. These can be great options. There are some limitations currently that I'm, I'm sure most of you have heard about in the news in terms of uh, availability. Uh, they have their own costs, which, which can be a challenge, but definitely for patients who can get insurance coverage for those medications. And if they're available, they can be a great option. What we like to do is just talk through all available options from the medications to the endoscopic revisions to the surgical revision options, just to make sure everyone understands all of those. All right, along those same lines, um, Kimberly wants to know, can you use the life coach if you feel like you can lose the weight without the revision? It is an option. Yeah, we do have some patients who maybe don't need a revision or aren't interested and may want to just enroll in our support program. Um, and so that is that could be an option as well. Uh, it really just depends on what, what your goals are, what your needs are, um, how much weight you're, you're seeking to lose. Um, so again, we, we would want to explore all of those pathways uh, with you. Perfect. This is a combination of a couple of questions from two of our, our viewers. Do you need a pre-procedure EGD? And are there any other tests needed before the procedure? Okay, so uh, you do not need a routine EGD or endoscopy before this procedure, uh, it's really unlikely we'd find anything abnormal that would preclude us from doing the procedure. So our general um, pathway is to first make sure you're a candidate for all the other reasons I had mentioned during the presentation. You know, is this the right fit for you? Is it in line with your goals? Do you have the readiness to go down this path? We want to also make sure you have that general loss of restriction. So to me, that's really what we'd be looking for and with an endoscopy is, is a sleeve dilated. And if you tell me you can eat larger portions, that pretty much confirms it. So we can spare you of an endoscopy before the procedure. So what we do is during the procedure, we just evaluate everything very carefully before we actually perform it. As far as other testing, 
There isn't a lot because this isn't a surgical procedure. We do generally recommend uh, basic laboratory evaluation. Uh, and for some patients with certain medical conditions, we might do some additional testing like cardiac testing. But in general, it's just a lab panel. Uh, and, and that's the only requirement. Okay, next question. Will this procedure cause acid reflux? Uh, great question. So we know with the uh, surgical sleeve itself, uh, reflux is really common. Um, most patients who have a sleeve gastrectomy will experience some degree of acid reflux. It can be troublesome in up to a third of patients. Um, and if someone had really bad reflux where it was not well controlled, even with medication, we might not recommend this procedure because frankly, the best treatment for that might be conversion to a gastric bypass, which relieves acid reflux. But that's not a common scenario. Let's just say someone comes without reflux, comes in for this procedure, would they develop reflux? We've not really seen that. Uh, this procedure does not appear to cause that. Uh, we aren't creating more pressure with this procedure. The reason patients have acid reflux with the original sleeve is it's a high pressure system, stapled in really tight. And so acid just sort of drives straight upward. With this, we aren't really um, creating more pressure. We are uh, making the stomach smaller and kind of bunching it up, but it does not appear to cause reflux, at least outside of the first few days or week when you're just adjusting to it. And um, Colleen, if, if you have any questions for Victoria, um, I wouldn't mind allowing her to answer a few. Uh, I think that, I think this one you can answer, Victoria. Um, do I have to exercise to lose the weight? Um, so we do a combination of things. We, we do talk about um, nutrition a lot, very heavily, but we also have an exercise goal that we encourage our patients to work on as well as the nutrition component. Um, that is something that we don't actually have you start doing until your two weeks post procedure. So after having your procedure, um, when you're getting ready to start purees actually, and we typically recommend 30 to 60 minutes um, by five days a week with two days of strength training. Um, but we, we also like to go at your pace too. So if, if you're not feeling like you're ready yet at purees, if you're not feeling like you have enough energy, then, you know, we really try and customize it to each person. Great. Okay. Talking about caffeine, um, we're told no surgery, no soda after surgery, talking about the initial surgery, but most people do it anyway. Um, in this case, how will that affect the revision, even if the soda drink is diet? Um, so carbonated beverages contain gas. So that's going to be like the bubbles that you have in them. And when those gases become warmed, they expand in your stomach and it can make you feel uncomfortable. Um, it can, can feel like a stabbing pain. At least that's how some patients have described it. Um, it, it doesn't have to be something that you avoid forever, but you should weigh the pros and cons before having that carbonated beverage. So did you drink sugary soda prior to the procedure? Was it an issue for you? Would going back to carbonation be um, a slippery slope, even if it is diet or a sugar-free drink? Um, those bubbles also can give you a false sense of fullness or a false sense of satiety. Um, and you want to make sure that you're protecting your new, new stomach, most importantly. Um, and, and those expansion from those bubbles, it's kind of like stretching out that stomach to a higher capacity, like a rubber band. So stomach is elastic in nature. If you push that rubber band too much and too often, it's going to retract and say, it's not going to retract in the same manner. Great. All right. Sorry, Dr. McGowan, this one's back to you. Um, how do you know how tight to make my stomach? Yeah. So really our goal with this is to make the stomach as tight as we safely can. I mean, we really want to have a major impact with this procedure. And the way that we assess that during the procedure is just making sure it is as snug as we can make it while allowing the scope to travel through the stomach. So uh, we want to make sure we can get our scope through. That means there's a sufficient channel for food and liquid to make its way through. But we really don't want to leave much more room than that. So we're aiming for as tight as safely possible. Every patient always says uh, to me in the pre-procedure area, make it as tight as you possibly can, close it down. And I understand the sentiment uh, and we could, but that would not be productive. So we wanna leave that little bit of space, but otherwise definitely as tight as we can go. Okay. So um, why haven't I ever heard of this procedure, especially when I'm talking to my doctor about weight loss options? Yeah, this is uh, in, in some respects a, a newer procedure, though it's actually been performed for nearly 10 years. The issue is it is, uh, it's a very um, 
highly specialized procedure. So there are only um, really a handful of centers in the country who perform this routinely and well and with expertise. Uh, and that, that's really what it's about. It's technically a more challenging procedure to perform. So you just don't see it everywhere. Uh, that is definitely changing. Um, and there's more and more providers getting trained and, and, and able to perform this procedure. Um, but, but that's the primary reason. So uh, we'll see uh, more awareness of this as time goes on. Great. Questions keep rolling in. Um, from Amanda, does the hunger hormone go away like it did with my original surgery? Yeah, hunger is really complex. So with the original surgery, uh, the surgeon removes that significant amount of the stomach, including the top of the stomach, where many of the cells that produce the hunger hormone ghrelin do reside. And, and it, definitely that is true. You have that surgery, your hunger goes down, almost disappears for a period of time. But of course, it does creep back. Uh, we can't remove any more stomach. So we're really indirectly affecting hunger uh, by tightening the stomach and altering how food and, uh, exits the stomach and how long it stays within. We're able to basically tell your brain that you're satisfied with the less food and for longer. And that diminishes those hunger hormones and all of the more complex hunger pathways. It's really not just about that one hunger hormone. It's really, really complex. And when we talk about appetite and hunger, we have to look at a lot of factors. You know, you think of the stomach and then there's the brain, but there's all the things that affect those two. There's sleep. It's one that's often forgotten and ignored, but if you don't sleep enough, all of those hunger pathways are disrupted and you'll be much hungrier than if you get that seven hours or more of sleep. So super important. We look at medications. If someone says they're you know, really hungry, we're gonna look at medications they're taking. Some of them can trigger hunger and then we might need to address some of those. Uh, so there's all of those other factors that we need to look at. And of course, nutrition. And so uh, Victoria and her colleagues will review um, your macros and what you're eating. And, and maybe we can adjust some of those to increase that sense of fullness. Great. All right, here's a question for you, Victoria. Um, will I have to log and measure my food? after this procedure? That's a loaded question. Um, I definitely think that it's very important to log and measure food, especially in the beginning, um, because you wanna know that number one, you're meeting those goals. So are you getting at least 60 to 90 grams of protein per day? Are you getting 64 ounces of fluids? If you're not, you know, we need to go back and see where we might be able to add things in in order to make sure you are meeting those goals. Um, protein is a very important macronutrient after having a bariatric procedure, but all of the other macronutrients are also important. So if you're only counting protein and you're like, well, shoot, I'm hungry, like a couple hours later or a couple minutes later, you know, it's kind of hard to tell if we're not logging what we're having or measuring what we're having. Um, so I do think it's necessary, especially in those, those first very early months, um, to make sure that you are logging and measuring in order to be accurate and to know where we might need to change things if we need to change things. Great. Next question back to you, Dr. McGowan. Will this procedure cause dumping? Oh, uh, dumping syndrome. No, it won't. Uh, dumping syndrome is uh, something we see with gastric bypass, uh, which is where things can exit the stomach too rapidly. Um, the reason that happens is the, uh, the valve at the bottom of the stomach called the pylorus is cut during a gastric bypass and, and kind of opened up. With, the, with this or the surgical sleeve, we don't do any of that. Everything's left intact. So uh, no, actually quite the opposite. If anything, this slows things down. So no, you should not experience dumping. Great. Okay. So I am a traveler and I'm in Houston, Texas on assignment. Could my consultation be done via webinar? Oh, yes. Uh, all of our, uh, well, yes, via a virtual consultation. Um, we, we do all of our, uh, actually, all of our visits are, are done uh, via telehealth. So um, consults we do virtually via um, Zoom or um, Microsoft Teams. And then really, other than the procedure and that initial next day follow-up, everything thereafter is also virtual. And, and that's something that we... Um, that's our, our protocol for patients who are from Texas or down the street. We really uh, think that that's essential. The reason is we want to reduce any barriers to follow up. We want to see you. Um, most of our visits aren't going to take a lot of time. You can jump on Zoom during a lunch break or, or another time during the day. And so, so, yeah, everything we will do virtually just to make it as convenient as possible. Great. Next question from Lashara. Is gas used to expand the stomach during the procedure? 
Yes, we do. So um, in order to see, we have to inflate the sleeve with gas. It is CO2 uh, and it's only within the stomach. So we are inflating the stomach so we can see and perform the procedure. And then we suction all of that out. Um, you can have a little bit of gas pressure from the procedure uh, as a result, but it's a lot different than the laparoscopic sleeve that, that if you've had that previously, where the entire abdomen is expanded with gas so that the stomach can be seen from the outside. Uh, that's what causes a lot of that really severe discomfort after surgical procedures, because it's hard to get all of that out. And that's really irritating. Uh, we're just working from within the stomach. So um, if that was the part of the question, yeah, you, you will have a little bit of gas pressure, but not much. Great. So this question is from Sandy, and um, we may need a little clarification, but the question is, will the surgery help my medical condition so that I can get off protonics? Okay, yeah. Well, protonics is for acid reflux. And as I mentioned, we don't see reflux increase. We have had patients um, experience improvement in acid reflux. It's not something I'd promise because I think it's going to depend on the individual and probably is more related to how much weight you end up losing through this process. Definitely losing weight will uh, usually lead to a reduction in acid reflux. So that would be a great thing. Uh, if we see that improve, you can come off of your medication or reduce your medication. That would be only one condition. Uh, there are many others that will most definitely improve as you lose weight. So I had mentioned that 16% weight loss or so with this procedure, uh, anything above 5% or certainly 10% weight loss, we see improvement in all health parameters. And so we see cholesterol improve, blood sugars improve, improve blood pressure improves, sleep apnea improves. All of these things improve if you're above 10%. And it would be really unusual to lose less than 10% with this type of procedure. So in general, yes. Uh, and that's one of those wonderful things. And it's not just about the scale, it's about improving health. And so um, we definitely see that. Okay. Next question also from Sandy is, do you do gastric bypass? So this might be a really good opportunity to kind of talk about the difference between endobariatrics and bariatric surgery. Thank you. Yes. No, I do not. Um, so I'm uh, a gastroenterologist. All of our physicians are trained as gastroenterologists. So we only work with the endoscopic tools. We're within this uh, newer field, which is endoscopic bariatric therapies. So not surgeons. So um, if, if a patient of mine needed a gastric bypass, uh, we would refer to uh, a surgeon that we trust, but uh, distinct fields, definitely. We do, I, I will, I guess I, I, I'll mention, um, we do treat patients who have experienced weight regain after a gastric bypass. So uh, somewhat related, but technically different procedure that we offer to tighten uh, a gastric bypass using these endoscopic tools. Great. Here is a question about medications. Um, are the medications, the weight loss medications covered by insurance? So weight loss medications, um, it's hard to avoid them in the news right now, right? I, probably for the past year. <laughs> um, they're really effective. So we're big proponents of medications like uh, Wegovy and Ozempic, which are semaglutide. Um, the biggest problem is they are not routinely covered by insurance. Uh, not yet. Um, there's a lot of energy being put into uh, trying to convince insurers to pay for them. But much like we see with these types of procedures and anything weight related, insurers are still reluctant to pay for them. So um, only a minority of insurance plans will cover them. Uh, what that means is the out-of-pocket cost is pretty high. It's, it's around $1,400 a month for most of those medications. And importantly, you have to stay on them once you stop the, start them because you can regain the weight pretty rapidly if you stop them. So it is this ongoing cost uh, month after month, year after year. So that's something that we're really, um, really transparent about with patients. Uh, you know, we want to understand all of those obstacles to any of these treatments. Great. Um, this is for you, Victoria. Are there any foods or drinks that I'll never be able to enjoy again? Um, I think that also is something that varies from person to person. Um, it, it's, it's going to be dependent on you because everybody's stomach is going to be different. Um, it's going to be different before having a revision. It's going to be different afterwards. Um, I, I don't say that there are any foods or beverages that anyone can absolutely never have ever again, unless you have like a medical condition like celiac, where you have to avoid gluten or, you know, something that you're allergic to. Um, but again, it's, it's going to vary from, from person to person. Right. 
Um, this one's for you, Dr. McGowan. Um, we've just got a few more. Can you have this procedure more than once? Hmm. Uh, technically, you could. Um, we would want to really talk through that, and it would, I think it would depend on the situation. Uh, but yes, you could. You know, we we can we can retighten uh, a sleeve if there's room to do so. Um, but you know, again, I think we'd want to th really sit down and, and discuss what's going on and and uh, determine if that's the best route. It, it speaks to the the real importance uh, with this process of kind of retraining behavior, uh, establishing those habits, really focusing on that maintenance phase. Like I mentioned, we 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 know that uh, a sleeve can stretch, right? I mean, that's why we're having this conversation. Things can stretch, the stomach can stretch. So I would never say that any procedure is truly permanent. And if for some reason a revision of any kind were to stretch, you know, we'd have to look at our options. Would it be another endoscopic revision? Uh, would it be medications? Uh, you know, we want to really address that um, and be thoughtful about it. But but the point is, if you're undergoing any revision of any kind, we really want to understand, yes, things could stretch over time. We have to really focus uh, and, and have as much follow up as possible to ensure that you know, we establish those really permanent behaviors and um, do our best to really ensure that uh, we keep the weight off long term. But from a technical standpoint, it could be done. Great. Here's a question from Kimberly about Ozempic. Um, she wants to know, isn't Ozempic a diabetes medication? And if you're not diabetic, can taking it affect the pancreas? Yeah, so that, uh, that is right, Kimberly. You know, Ozempic is a diabetes treatment. Uh, it's a treatment for type 2 diabetes. Um, Ozempic's been assigned, it's sort of like every weight loss medication, all these medications are just called Ozempic, like in the media. But in reality, Ozempic is a treatment for type 2 diabetes. It's uh, Sister medication is Wegovy, uh, which is for the treatment of weight, but the active ingredient is the same, which is semaglutide. Uh, could you use Ozempic if you don't have diabetes? You could, but your insurance won't cover it because you need that diagnosis. Uh, and they don't directly affect the pancreas per se. Um, in, in fact, they're safe to use if you don't have diabetes. Um, so um, are there risks? Of course. Pancreatitis, which is a, a inflammation of the pancreas, is an ultra rare risk that, that has been somewhat associated with their use, but it's, that's not even uh, definitive. We could talk a lot about medications, so, but feel free to ask more questions about them. Okay, um, here's another question. Are there any BMI restrictions for this procedure? So in general, uh, again, we're gonna have to you know, review each individual's own situation, um, but uh, roughly, BMI of 30 to 50, um, but that's not absolute. So we can go outside of those ranges depending on uh, the individual. Great. Okay, looking to see. Um, okay, last, I think this is possibly our last question. Um, do you prescribe the medication for the pharmacy and do they allow it, or do they allow it to be filled even if you don't have diabetes? So yeah, this would be about Ozempic uh, as well. Uh, okay, so if um, so, if I prescribed you Ozempic, but you don't have diabetes, what's going to happen is the uh, pharmacy will try to run it through your insurance, and it will be denied. So um, that's more of an insurance than a pharmacy issue. Uh, if I were prescribing a medication, weight loss medication for a patient who doesn't have diabetes, I'm going to recommend Wegovy because that's the that's what it's uh, intended for. Um, I suppose if you were paying cash for medication, which is not easy to do. Uh, but uh, you 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 could obtain either, but in the, either way, we go V is the is the one designed for weight loss. So we we try to stick to that. Okay. Last question, um, and I think you touched on this earlier, but um, how will the recovery from this procedure compare to recovery from the original VSG? Yeah, the, it, this is the one of the big differences with the original surgery is the recovery and the risk are vastly different. The recovery here is pretty brief. I mean, you never know for sure what uh, an individual's experience will be, but we say three to five days because that's the average. You know, some people have minimal to no symptoms uh, and can be back in action right away. Some people will have a lot of cramping, even nausea for a few days, but that's generally it. Once you're transitioning through your uh, diet and you're reaching your protein goals and you're hydrating well, you should start feeling good re really quite soon and definitely within a week. Uh, and then beyond that, you know, you should be feeling good just, um, you know, eating smaller portions. All right. 
I think that actually concludes our questions unless we have any last ones coming in. Nope, I don't see anything. So just wanted to thank you everyone for coming. We are just so grateful to see so many of you here. And thank you again for being with us. Um, if you're interested in booking a consultation, you can do that easily from the website. One of our patient ambassadors will reach out to you uh, shortly to start the process. Um, hope this has been helpful and giving you a great overview of the VSGR procedure. Um, let's see, I feel like another question may have just popped in. Sorry, a few more questions and it's not nine o'clock yet. So I'm gonna answer them. Um, what, what would happen if I had acid reflux right after the surgery and had to stay longer in the hospital? Hmm. Um, that would be really unusual. I guess maybe the bigger question is what if something happens and you, you know, how do we handle that? Um, that's not happened with this procedure. We realize there are risks though. You know, I mentioned some of those really rare things. Um, that's why we monitor you so closely. And obviously we would, we would take care of anything that's going on um, and, and make sure everyone's taken care of. But um, everyone goes home after this procedure, you know, speaking to the, that low risk. But that's why we ensure the procedure is done safely. We ensure there's no active bleeding at the end of the procedure. And more importantly, that's why we see you the day after. So if something seems like it's not going along the normal path, we're going to get that evaluated and get things checked out. Perfect. Another quick question. Um, actually, I think it would be important to reiterate, uh, Dr. McGowan, that generally you're not staying overnight for the procedure, correct? You're, oh, you're thank you. Yeah, no, no. Yeah. Outpatient. These are same day procedures. So uh, you come in, have the procedure, and then you would leave the facility within an hour afterwards. Thank you. Perfect. And how do we decide who gets a prescription when we're talking about weight loss medications? Uh, well, that's uh, those are things we talk about during a consultation when we're talking about these different options um, and we'll review your health history and, and look at what would be an option for you as an individual. So that's really when that would take place. So um, uh, if, if you're someone who's interested in, in um, assistance, you would meet with myself, one of our nurse practitioners, Dr. Maselli in Atlanta. Um, you know, that's our medical team. And so we would review everything. All right, this is actually truly the very last question. Um, is there a cost to the consultation? Uh, there is a small fee for our consultations. Uh, if you do move forward with our services, we just credit that to, to, the, uh, to the procedure or service though. Great, and I lied because there's five minutes left and I wanna make sure we answer everybody's questions and Lashara had a great question. Um, would IV hydration be recommended to stay hydrated after the procedure? Yeah, hydration is great. You know, it, it, we're making the sleeve as tight as we safely can, as I mentioned, and it can be hard the first few days to get liquid down. So uh, we give actually a couple of liters of IV fluid the day of the procedure. We give another liter of IV fluid the day after at that follow-up visit. That's a lot of IV fluid. So really you're protected for a few days, a couple of days. Uh, but if you feel like you're still maybe not meeting your goals um, a couple of days later, you know, get some extra hydration. That could be with us if you're in town, you just come on back. We give some extra fluid or there are so many hydration centers around these days, you can just pop into one and get some extra fluid. We definitely, uh, definitely recommend that. Great. Well, that concludes our presentation, Dr. McGowan, unless you have anything else you'd like to add. No, I think that's great. Thank you. Thank you all so much for coming and have a wonderful evening.